Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for Church Online. We're glad that you're here today, and I know you'll be blessed by our service today. I just want to let you know a few things that's going on in the life of our church as we begin our service today. The very first thing is we want you to know that in this season of life, I know some of you right now are struggling with some really difficult things, and we just want you to know that we're here for you and we're praying for you specifically. And today, we would love to know ways that we can be praying for you and partnering with you as we all go through this season of life together. And so if you have a prayer request, we would love to know about it. If you could just go to baycitieslimited.com slash pray, or just hit the prayer tab on the Bay Cities app. That'll go directly to us, and, and we can know ways that we can partner with you and be praying for you, because in any situation in your life, we never want you to have to go through it alone. And then secondly, I just want to say thank you so much for all of your generosity to our church. We're just blown away by how generous you've been during this current season. And today, as we work to reach many people, not only here in our community in Los Angeles, but also all over the country and the world. We just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. And if you're interested in supporting our mission today and supporting our church, there are, there's a number of ways in which you can give. But the best way is just to go to www.baycitieslimited.com slash giving. And then today, we're going to go into worship in just a couple of seconds. But today we're continuing our series from Pastor Ben called Knowing Is Not Enough. And as we enter into this next season, as we enter into the second month of 2021, knowing is not enough it becomes so important for us to incorporate and live out in our everyday life. And so let's lean in and, and let's listen as, as we worship together and as we hear the message together and see what God wants to speak to us today. Oh, oh, oh. 
Hey everybody, it's Pastor Ben. It's good to see you here. Great to be with you guys today. Oh, if we get started here on this, uh, this fascinating day and this good week. Man, have, have we gotten good at saying no to these days? Have you noticed that? We're just really good at saying no. I mean, to just about everything fun, that's for sure. And that isn't my most pleasant place to be in. But I mean, we said no to just about everything over Christmas, right? We didn't see anybody. We didn't, we didn't go anywhere. We said, ne- ne- uh, we said no to parties, no to vacations. Can you imagine the number of vacations you may have missed or at least time to get refreshed? We have said no to, to uh, being in the hospital with our loved ones. That seemed like a bridge too far to those, those of us who have uh, had hospital stays. We said no to going to school for our kids. <laughs> but we had to say yes to teaching them at home, which has been exciting, of course. We said no to working out at the gym, no to hugging. And no to even being at church or, and for many of us, to really be able to be in person in a small group. We've said no because of the COVID fears. And, and you know, and we've gotten really way too good at saying no. And sometimes for, for reasonable reasons, but still, we've gotten way too good at saying no. And man, if you're like me, I'll bet you can't wait to begin to start saying yes to a few things. I mean, yes to dining in a restaurant, yes to having church together with all of us you know yes to hanging kind of at your favorite coffee shop with somebody for two hours can you imagine being in a coffee shop ordering coffee having a a little something sweet to eat as you're sitting there and enjoying a long luxurious conversation it seems heaven-like at this point and then being able to say no to wearing masks and social distancing won't that be a good day that'll be a very good day But we have just had to learn the art of saying no because we didn't say no to everything. I mean, some things we did. We we tried to discern safe distance, but we got together, you know. I mean, unless I guess unless you've been a real purist about this thing. Uh, I mean, we took walks outside and we kind of left our mask down at half mast, right? Uh, We we looked in on each other a bit. We didn't just stay completely separate. I mean, we did some travel. Some of us fished. (laughs) People to be unnamed at this point. And we, we did some things where we had to kind of learn the art of saying no in a creative way as well. Uh, this past Sunday, Brian Nall, one of our members of the church, came over. He just lived down the street. And we began to talk about some stuff. About We started talking about MMA wrestling. And I'm, fine, I'm not an MMA guy generally, but I've seen a few of the, of the matches. Powerful athletes going after each other. Really impressive stuff. And then we watched the AFC Championship game. And what we noticed, what, just, what we started talking about with the referees. I'm wearing this referee shirt today because it so struck me that the referees determined right and wrong in the game the two contenders were going at it right and there were times when the referee needed to step in and boy they made themselves known and today as we continue in our series knowing is not enough Jesus is going to take us into a parable today a parable is just a story with a religious point to it and and what he's going to take us into a story about two guys One who was a religious perfectionist and the other who was a tax gatherer. And both of them ended up together in church at the same time. It's a great story. And as the dust settles, Jesus is the ref. And he's going to tell us who won and who lost in this this wrestling match that takes place between a very proudful guy and it turns out a very humble guy. And the results are on display for us to understand. And what we're going to see is that knowing about humility, knowing about being humble is not enough. It's nothing until you put it into action in your life. And we're going to see that in a very powerful way today. So let's pray as we, we begin here today. Father, I pray for, for everyone that, that's watching today as we're, we're thinking together about this subject of learning to say yes of learning to deal with humility in a way that you've intended for us to. And Lord, would you open our hearts and our minds to, the, to really the art of saying yes to you in a more wonderful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, take your Bibles here today and open, if you will, with me. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 in your Bibles. See, Jesus here is doing what he did often, right? He used parables. He used these religious stories to make some very important points. And he put people in the story to help the points be made. And here, as we begin uh, this story, 
He's speaking to his followers in the first part of, of Luke chapter 18. But by the time we get to verse 9, it seems like his audience shifts. In fact, as it opens, his audience apparently includes people who struggled with this thing about self-righteousness, right? De- determining and self-justifying themselves. And so he begins to speak to them uh, about, about what it meant to be really humble versus to be self-justified. And he has something very special to say to us. So we're going we're gonna to listen in to the story and what Jesus is refereeing here today. So Jesus referees the first proud guy versus humble guy match. Have I set this up well enough for you? Luke chapter 18, let's begin. Verse 9. It says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So you can see that that's who his audience is that he's going to speak to us about today. Verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. I'll talk about them in just a minute. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this way. So he stands up. He says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Mm-mm. Not like cheaters, not like sinners, not like adulterers. Mm-mm. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. You can see where this is going. I fast twice a week. I give you, Lord, a tenth of my income. I'm a good guy. But the tax collector, at the same time, who stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes, so his eyes aren't even able to look up, he's so overwrought with his own sense of sinfulness and that he's in the wrong place (laughs) for a guy like him. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven, the, the passage says, as he prayed. Instead, he bent his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, he said, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Now, I can't wait to talk about this. <laughs> but this story illustrates really the truth about humility. And here it is. Let's sort of sort out the players uh, to get it started. First, in this corner, the Pharisee. Here's what we know about him from the story, right? The Pharisee. We could, he could get every Bible question right. There's no, no, there's no reason to think he couldn't. I mean, he grew up, uh, likely as a Pharisee, he grew up in, in a religious family. They trained him well. And then he went to a religious high school, religious college, you know, sort of put it in our vernacular. And he had been trained. He knew all the right answers to the questions that were ever going to be asked on a religious test. He could cite everything. In fact, and so he could also show a long list of what he didn't do, right? It isn't what he did. He could tell you what he didn't do, right? He didn't drink, smoke, or chew, go out with girls that do. <laughs> a little way to look at that. But he, he had a long list here, and he could give you a longer list of what he didn't do. And notice what else. He compared himself, not to God, but to other people. You know, those famous others. We call it the famous they. You know, they always do this and I never do that he did it so well and he was self-justified he said you know what in a way he said you know God's kind of lucky to have me here (laughs) you know I am sort of an (laughs) all-star that's what he's describing he says you know I am not like these other people I don't do what they do I have religiously kept all the rules all the ones he happened to think of at the moment he sort of, Lord, I am your, I am just, I am just, I am just another level. That's what he represented and how he was represented here in the parable. And he evaluated that his, his life was great and he was on the fast track to heaven and a fast track to pleasing God. I mean, that's the attitude you get as you listen to the, the references and the inferences here, you know, about the Pharisee. He fasted, he gave to God, he was good to go. And he self-justified himself based on his view of the standards that he had set as a religious man. So that's who's in corner A. And corner B, in the other corner, is the tax collector. Now, what do we know about the tax collector? Well, we know from history that he was a despised man. He had extorted money from his fellow Jews, and he knew it. I mean, he was... He was, by profession, 
a professional extorter. That's what he did. He would have Roman soldiers with him. He would set up his table, and wherever you pass by in this particular place, he would collect the tax, and he had the muscle behind him to make sure you paid. In the Greek, the word tax collector was the word mokes, M-O-K-H-E-S. He was, he was a little mokes, right? He had, he had an operation. And probably he had scribes around him, people to help keep track of the roles of people who paid taxes who didn't in his area. But he was a small mokes. You know, there's a guy named Zacchaeus in the Bible. If you remember him, Jesus had something to deal with him too. He was a big mokes. In other words, he was a big tax collector. He had a whole bunch of guys like Matthew, the tax collector, who was one of the guys Jesus called to be a disciple. He had lots of guys like Matthew who worked for him. So the tax collector worked for the Romans. He extorted money from the people. And he, he always collected enough so he had some for himself. So he was a rich guy. Now he was a socially despised person, but he had money. And he was considered a traitor because he was a Jew. And he extorted money from them for the Romans. Can you, you see the picture? This guy was sort of a deep state guy, right? And when it came to the temple, the tax collectors were considered so low on the totem pole that they were literally considered publicans and sinners. They could not testify in court and they could not tithe in the local temple. Their money was no good in the temple. I mean, <laughs> whose money is no good at church? That's how low of a man this man was. And the Pharisee saw the tax collector as an enemy to be shunned and Jesus saw tax collectors and people like him Maybe even people like us as the spiritually sick that needed to be healed. Boy, the perspective couldn't be greater. And for the tax collector, a little more about him. He couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven when he prayed because he was so ashamed of his life. I mean, he, he, he came to church. And the Pharisee is praying, standing up, said, look at me. Look at how good I am. And the, and the tax collector is bent over trying to not even draw attention to him. He's so self-disgusted, realizing what a sinner he is in the presence of God's holiness, that he couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. In other words, he humbled himself because he compared himself to God. Interesting that the tax gatherer compared himself to God and the, and the Pharisee compared himself to the tax collector. You see the difference in the standard as, they, as this story moves on? He was a sinner, acknowledged the same, and he cried out to God. What did he cry out to God? For mercy. At church. The Pharisee didn't even cry out to God. He said, God, you're lucky I'm here, and I know I'm one of your special ones. I'm not like him. Instead of self-justifying as the Pharisee had done, this man really confessed. He said, look, I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. Isn't it good just to hear honesty? And it's how, how interesting. And then Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus starts off the Beatitudes, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon he ever preached that kind of just introduced everybody to the kingdom of God. And the first part of it is about how you get into the kingdom. And he says this in the first three verses. And, and they begin this way. They're the qualifications for entering heaven. And he began this way. He said, he said blessed are those excuse me, who see themselves poor in spirit, that they have nothing to bring. And they need God in every way, that they are spiritually bankrupt. Isn't that exactly the way the, the tax collector saw himself? He said, those people get into heaven. He said, blessed are those who mourn over their sins in, in, chapter, in Matthew 5, verse 4, and they will find comfort. What did this... this I can't talk. What did this tax collector do? He mourned over his sin, right? He was sad for it. And finally, in Ephesians 5.5, 5, he says, Blessed are those who humble themselves, those who are the meek, the humble. And that's exactly who the tax collector presented himself to be. The humble, he says, the humble will inherit the kingdom of God. They'll inherit the earth. This is, this is just an outstanding picture of humility, of a man humbling himself. So the tax 
collector humbled himself and the Pharisee did not. And now as the, as the parable comes to an end, Jesus calls the match. The referee steps forward and the two contestants, he takes one hand and he takes the other hand. And in Luke 18, verse 14, listen to what he, he says. He says, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Man, that was not the finish that the religious guys expected. Mm -mm. That wasn't the verdict. Jesus said the, the humble man wins, the proud man loses. It was a Hail Mary finish, for sure, for those of you who are football fans. And Jesus said the tax collector went home justified before God. The proud get humbled, he said, and the humbled let, uh, get lifted up. See, humility is not what you know about and then live differently. Mm -mm. Humility is what you do with the reality that we're to humble ourselves before God. And that's exactly what the tax collector do, did. And the Pharisee did just the opposite. And God granted the tax collector the victory and the lifting of himself up by God. See, God loves humble people. I mean, that's the story here. He can pick them out of any situation. Even at church, he picked out the humble. And he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And in due time, he's going to lift them up. And listen, I want to encourage you today. Remember this story. Your life will go better when you understand what humility is about, that you must humble yourself. Or as a, another passage on humility says, God will humble you under his mighty right hand. You don't want that. That is not a good thing. He says, move to be humble and you'll find God's lifting you up at the right time. So what, what is the truth about humility? Here it is, number two in your notes. You can know all about humility, but until you humble yourself before God, it's only a talking point. Let me say that again. You can know all about humility, but until you humble yourself before God, it's only a talking point. What I want you to do now, I want you to put yourself into the story here. As a Pharisee, let's take a look at him, right? He had little excuse for his arrogance and pride. Why? Because the Pharisees certainly had been taught about humility. The Old Testament is, is full, full of stories and teaching about humility. In fact, I have one for you real quick. I'm just going to breeze through it. But the story of Uzziah, U-Z-Z-I-A-H for you men, the story of Uzziah, he would have known that story. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, Uzziah is, is quite an interesting guy. He becomes king at 16. At 16. He, following Zechariah as, 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 as one of his mentors, and as he follows him, what happens is he gets smarter, he becomes wiser, and as he grows, he becomes a great king. He becomes a great military leader. He rescues, essentially, keeps Israel solid, and he does tremendously well. Until, until something happened. And that something that happened took place in verse 16 of Second uh, Chronicles chapter 26. You can, you can take a look there with me. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led his downfall. Hear that? It was his pride that led his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So he decided that he was going to self-style himself right into a whole new way of functioning with God. He says, I got this now. I'm so powerful. God and me, we're, we're just kind of friends and partners. I just do what I want. He understands. And, and the priest came up to rebuke him and said, no, no, no. What are you doing? You can't do that. This is God's altar. There's protocol here. We don't move that way here. It's disrespectful. And he would not repent. And then what happens is, is just chilling. It says, when Azariah the chief priest and all the others looked at him, looked at uh, Uzziah, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. 
King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house. Lepers and banned from the, the temple. Uh, Jotham and his sons had charge of the palace and governed the land of, of uh, excuse me, the land. So his son took over. It says, And the other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recognized by the prophet Isaiah. Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in a cemetery that belonged to the kings. For people said he had leprosy. And that was the inscription on his tomb. After all the greatness of his life, after all that he had done, his arrogance and pride moved so much in front, God basically d d disciplined him for it. And his life ended up not lifted up, but pressed down to the point that none of his accomplishments stood out, only the fact that he had leprosy. I mean, is that not a story of humbling yourself versus lifting yourself up in pride? Humility wins, pride loses. I mean, the Pharisee would have known that. The truth is, he'd been saying yes to himself and no to God. He got good at that. He got really good at it. He had been com comparing himself to those less successful, less religious, less able, less Bible fluent, less informed of traditions. See, the, the Pharisee graded out well by his own assessment. So he assumed God graded the same way. But, but there's no win in comparison. Some of you who've had some Andy Stanley studies, I just thought of that. Nobody actually reminded me of it, that he had discussed this subject. And he said, you know, there's no win in comparison. I mean, in fact, it's a trap. You end up trapped in the land of Ur, E-R. And he says it this way. It's, it's a land of prettier, wealthier, faster, stronger, smarter. He fell for the trap of pride. He was more nobler than the tax collector. He was, more, he was smarter than the tax collector. He assumed that meant that God thought of him the way he thought of himself. And that wasn't the truth. Because the truth of the matter is God doesn't grade on the curve. Notice the proud man never compares himself with God and if he had he'd seen his comparison for what it was it was false pride that's exactly what it was maybe he would have repented we don't know God humble but it didn't happen so King Solomon the wisest man who had it all and blew it because of pride in his life looks back and he writes this in Proverbs 16 18 he said <clears throat> pride goes before destruction he said in haughtiness before fall that's exactly what this man is, uh, th this Pharisee is, is showing us his haughtiness and pride. And the fall is about to happen because God reminds us, Jesus reminds us that God lifts up the humble and he opposes the proud. That's what happened here. Let's look at the tax collector for just a minute. The tax collector lived his life strong arming people. I mean, this was not a good guy, right? Don't get the wrong impression here. Yet when he humbled himself, God forgave him and lifted up his life and his future. You see, it's not that the, that, that the Pharisee wasn't a good guy or didn't, you know, wasn't trying hard. And the other guy was just solid gold. No, the, the, the tax collector lived by his wits. In fact, he had faced the cries of of people asking him for mercy. You can imagine people who couldn't pay their taxes said, have mercy on me. And he said, no, pay your taxes. And if, you, if not, the Roman soldier is going to come and take you and throw you into jail. He had no mercy. He had overcharged many of them. <clears throat> he, had nothing to, he had nothing in him that would make him proud before God. Nothing. In fact, in fact just going to church, he was the guy, right? who said, I could never go into a church building, right, because the walls would fall in when I did. I mean, this is the guy. But in the parable, he humbles himself before God. And what happens is the tax man, who had never heard or listened to the story of Uzziah when, he, when his mom told it to him or when his Sunday school teacher told it, he was probably fooling around in the back. He was a Jew. He probably had religious upbringing. But the tax man said no to himself and yes to God in this prayer that Jesus is, in the situation that Jesus is citing for us. 
And the result was that the favor of God then rests on him and not the Pharisee. He said yes to God. He humbled himself. God forgave his sins. That man went home justified because he humbled himself. That, that's not all. Don't forget, the promise is not only that God would forgive his sin, if you will, but that God would lift him up. And we know in, in 1 Peter 5, 6 that he would lift him up at just the right time. How good that humility means you put yourself in God's hands that at the right time that God knows is just right, that he will lift your life up. He's trying to promote. He's looking to, to be the wind beneath your wings. He says, I'm looking for humble people so I can do that for them. But it was those who humbled themselves while the proud Pharisee <clears throat> was the biggest loser. So let's take the rest of our time here now. I think we understand the parable. I want to put this into the shoe leather of our lives. Let's apply this to our situations right here, right now in 2021. What's it mean to humble yourself. A couple of things here. Number one, here's what it means for us. Humbling ourselves means uh, by, we humble ourselves by saying yes to Jesus. You humble yourself when you say yes to Jesus. See, the tax guy started out not knowing Jesus at all. He had no religious in, 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 intentions. He, he was not a man looking for faith that day. In, in, in the Savior. But he met Jesus and his whole life changed. And it changed when he said yes to God and no to himself, to his old life. And to f any form of self-justification, you see it in his attitude and how he functioned, confession of his sin, he, he wasn't trying to self-justify. In fact, Titus 3, 5, the writer says this. He tells us that he, Jesus, saved us, not because of the righteousness we had done, not because we're so good, not because we've done really cool things, but because of his mercy. Your salvation is based on Jesus' mercy to you. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. See, that's why we're so, we're so thrilled, why we're so excited and so happy and so grateful because you can't earn your way to heaven, but God's mercy can make sure that you're, you're on the ride. And for those of you who might be on the outside of faith looking in, it's what Jesus did that secures your salvation, not your hard work. All the tax collector did was acknowledge the obvious, that he was a sinner, that he had no hope, and that he just needed God's mercy. And didn't even feel good about asking for it because he knew how deeply flawed he was. And yet God heard that prayer and answered it with a smile on his face. See, you can't earn your salvation because Jesus did it all. He paid for your sins and my sins in an act of sublime mercy, of, of sublime love. And you have to humble yourself and say yes. Say yes to Jesus and no to you to access his salvation. Humbling yourself is the pathway to heaven. It's the only way. There's no other way. So humbling yourself begins by saying yes to Jesus for salvation. And if you haven't done that, you need to say yes to him today. You can't earn your way to salvation. It isn't because your mom and dad are, say, are Christians. It's because you have now struck up a relationship, a personal relationship by humbling yourself and receiving him as Savior, and believing that he is the one, the Messiah, who died for your sins and rose again. He wants that for you. That's step one. The next step to humbling yourself is this. Humbling continues as you say yes to following him. So not only yes to, to Jesus to start a relationship, but now learning to say yes to him. Because we can say no. We can kind of, we can kind of just fade to black. We can, sort of, we can sort of just ease ourselves out of the mainstream here easily. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You want to say yes to following him. See, salvation is not a one-shot deal. It's not simply, I mean, it, you are saved forever by your decision and God's grace and Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. No question. But salvation, the entire 
process of salvation has some other parts to it. You're saved, first of all, from the penalty of sin when you receive Jesus as your Savior. But then now you're being continually conformed to the image of Jesus, becoming more like him through a process that's just called sanctification. But you're being saved now from the power of sin over time as you follow him, that he is making your flesh, your, your part that objects to God's leadership in your life, less powerful, and your new heart and your new desire to follow him more powerful. You're being saved from the power of sin in your life. And therefore, you need to say yes. You need to say yes. Sanctification is saying yes to this process. You, and here's what you do. You need to make Jesus the leader of your life. I, I like to think of it this way, uh, like driving a car. And, and many, many, most of us have an experience with driving a car. Here's what you do. You let Jesus drive by giving him the keys. Now, you can say, I'm driving, but if you don't have any keys, you ain't driving, right? You can say, yes, Jesus is my Lord, and he takes, he, he, I'm following him, but you know what? If you never let him drive, you don't put him in the driver's seat, he ain't driving. You're driving. And there is a distinct difference when you say yes to him, and you humble yourself, and you get behind him, and you begin to listen to him. You begin to take what he says, and you put it in to the decision-making part of you. I, you begin to follow the patterns that he is teaching, and you know now Jesus is driving, and you're a passenger in the car instead. The humbling step is giving him the keys, and by saying yes to his leading, your purpose unfolds. See, until you say yes to him, the purpose of being a believer now is, is shrouded in a lot of nice words. You know, it's good to be a believer. I'm going to heaven. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm saved. All those realities. But the next consideration is my purpose. My purpose is to love him. Until I let him drive, I don't, I don't get really connected to the idea that I'm to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, right? That's another act of humbling yourself. I take my energy to show my affection and obedience to him. It's a personal thing. Not only to love God, to love the people that he loves. See, that's what this process continues from salvation through this idea of being transformed into the image of Jesus, becoming a better lover of God and of people. See, when you say yes to Jesus and your leader, as your leader, your life starts making sense. The purpose of your life begins to become more clear to you, and it's a beautiful thing. But it requires humbling yourself to, to continue to participate well in that process. I think you can see that here. It doesn't, isn't something you would come up with. It, it's about submitting and then finding what you're looking for. Thirdly, humbling yourself also means that you say yes to listening to and supporting your spiritual leaders. And, and this is big. Saying yes to his design for the local church. And you show that by getting behind the leaders that are, that are leading out in the church you're part of. And for those of you here, we're, we're part of this church. And, and Nathan and I are the pastors of this church. You know, Nathan, our, our assistant pastor, he and I pastor this church. So if you want to say yes to God and, and yes to your leaders, then, then you're going to get behind the, the mission and the purpose that we help lay out for you. I've been a Christian, what, 50 years. I've been a leader in, in some manner in God's church for the last 40. <clears throat> and I've been serving the Lord the same way for 40 years. And this is what I've seen. Humble people look to see how they can help move the local ministry and mission forward. And they do it by supporting the vision and the, and the directions, if you will, of their leaders. Who, by the way, are not perfect. Now Nathan's pretty close, but I'm just a regular guy. But they listen to, and then they jump into the ministry, and they become players on the team. Now let me just give you an example. If you, if you joined a soccer team, I'm not a soccer player, you can tell, but if you join one, this, every soccer team has a few things. They have uniforms, a ball, and then what? A coach. And if you're going to be on that team, you would probably be really smart to listen to the coach. In fact, if you became a person on a team who didn't listen to the coach, how much playing time would you get? How happy would you be, right? So same with the church. I mean, it's, so I encourage you, if you want to know what it means to humble yourself in this process of, of growing as a believer, one of the things is to follow the, the leaders that God has given you. I've done that every place I've been. 
I started in Hawaii in a small church to a guy who was a Southern Baptist preacher from Texas. He spoke English in a way that I only understood half of it because of his Texas accent. But you know what? I submitted myself and I learned and I followed. He made me the youth guy. A little further along when I got married, met Novia, I became the music director of that little church and I preached in it. Now, I just wanted to serve. I wasn't looking to be. I, they, I, they just kept finding place things for me to do. But I was going to support that effort for all that it was worth. Came to California and I got involved in a, a youth ministry, became a, a, a singles intern. My friend Jim McKenga, who's the pastor of our Bay City's churches, the, the founding pastor here. He taught me how to do that, but, but I supported him. My wife and I both, we got on board. We, we had Bible studies. We had, we had small groups. I began teaching. I, I was teaching three, and, three times a week. But it began to grow. And then finally we, we moved to Southern California and became an associate pastor and then finally the pastor of this church. But it, in every, every instance, I, I've submitted myself to the leadership. And that's a beautiful thing to do because now I'm, I'm involved the way that God has given me through the church I'm a part of. Because when it comes to pastors and leaders, God gave them to us to build His kingdom. And your followership makes building possible. So all leaders are accountable to God, what they do. We don't just lead in, in, in a vacuum. But your faith journey is about saying yes to God and yes to the leaders here. Because when you do, we're able to build even better. So we can move the building plans that God has motivated us to make. We can move them forward with you as part of that process. Isn't that cool? Remember, he lifts up the humble. He opposes the proud. So, so stand by and believe in and follow the leaders that have been placed over you in the church you're in because that's the way the team functions. That's the way we move forward together. And lastly, humbling yourself means, means this, that you say yes to serving others. That's really humility and dramatic action. Jesus told us this so pointedly. He said this. He says, the greatest among you will be your servants. In other words, your servants are going to be considered the ones in heaven that are going to be the greatest. He said, don't kid yourself. It's not those who, who are the most flamboyant. It's those who are the most functionally excellent servants, the ones who put them serving as a top-notch issue. Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said just that. But listen, let me tell you something about serving. It's a tricky deal. You've got to say yes to serving. See, knowing about it is not enough. And it's important to know that just as motivation to get you to say yes a lot, Jesus adds this huge prize, right? He says the greatest among you. In other words, those who be considered tops, in my estimation, are those who are the servants of all the greatest in my kingdom will be my servants. I had a wonderful experience this week I want to tell you about. Our, no, my friend Diane Safa, who's a, a lady in our church, I mean, who's a very busy woman. I mean, she's got a life that is just loaded because of her, her, her time in life. She's a wife. She's a mom. She's a sister. Everybody lives locally. She's a daughter. She's a teacher to her kids, a daughter-in-law, a vital part of a big family. She's our church accountant. She pays the bills and all the bookkeeping, and she leads a growth group. She's busier than almost anyone I know. And what's cool about Diane, she smiles a lot. It's just, you know, when she's running around, I know she's got a ton of things. She's got kids in the car. She just smiles. She's a pleasure to be around. But one of the things Diane's gotten really, really good at, she's gotten good at finding appointments for COVID vaccinations. Have you, have, those of you who are over 65, I know you're going, oh, Ben, you can't be over, oh, yeah, I'm way over 65. I am, I'm on my way to 70 in really, really close order. But, but the, the ability to find a vaccination is not easy. I tried for a few weeks, and man, even when the, 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 the annou announcement that there's vaccinations, no, they're not. You've got to go find the appointments, and they are very scarce, very hard to find. But Diane, because she has a bunch of people that are, that are older than she and her family, she has been great at, at finding them online and being able to get people connected up with 
with vaccinations. So we were just talking yesterday, and she told me about what she was doing, and she said, how are you doing it? I said, not very well. She gave me a suggestion about a website, went on there, and there were no, no uh, appointments. She said, no, but she said, you got to keep checking. I said, oh, thanks, Diane. I love you, man. Thanks, thanks a bunch. So this morning, I get this call. Diane says, hey, I was just checking, and there's appointments. Really? So she said, look, I got it open. Just give me your, your info. I'll get you signed up. So I gave her the info. She signed me up, and bingo, I got an appointment. And I had the vaccination. Isn't that cool? I mean, all in a short amount of time. You see, w- what happened was, even though Diane's really, really busy, she, she takes time to serve other people. Now, I don't want to set her up as the, the, the focal point where everybody calls Diane. I just want you to know that, please. You know, respect the story. But I think it was just because I was talking to her the day before, and she says, I'm kind of in the flow here. And she is willing to give herself. She's willing to, to continually humble herself. She doesn't just know about being a servant. She is one. And it means she does stuff that isn't necessarily convenient. It's not necessarily easy. But she gets it done. She's busy. And to serve, she has to say yes to serving. And this time, I just happen to be the benefactor. But the point is, do you see what I mean? Busy people oftentimes are some of the greatest servants because they know to get things done. They've got to move. They've got to engage. And she does that in a beautiful way. And I pray that that would become your plan as a servant. Because if you want to humble yourself, my friends, you have to learn to say yes to God. To say yes to Jesus for salvation. To say yes to following Jesus to become more like Him. Say yes to listening and obeying your spiritual leaders so we can build something special here for Jesus. And saying yes to being a servant. It'll take practice. And it doesn't always feel good. Don't let that be the determiner of humbling yourself. Sometimes you're going to humble yourself and feel like you just gave away the sink and everything else that you had. No. This is remembering that those who humble themselves will be exalted. That he built us to take on that attitude. And he blesses those who do. And remember that knowing about humility is not enough. But if you understand what's at stake, if you want the reward, if you will humble yourself before God, the reward will be there. He will lift you up. You will be considered great in his kingdom. It's a beautiful thing. Let me wrap this up. Jesus continued in verse 12 of of Matthew's passage just like he did in Luke 8, 14, to remind us why humility is the only way this reward comes about. He said this, but to those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those full of pride, those who, who self-promote and evaluate their standing with God by looking at others will be humbled. He says, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So will you keep humbling yourself? Mm, that's the question of the day it's the choice that comes with a huge reward that he'll lift you up at the right time imagine what that will look like in your life well next week knowing is not enough the th- our theme next week we're going to talk about denying yourself the pathway to gaining what you really want pastor nathan is going to be leading us through this very very powerful look at what saying no to you is really all about to get to the good stuff Friends, may we be people that learn how to humble ourselves, that in due time He will lift us up. Let's pray as we close. Father, I love you. I thank you for all that you have un- unveiled to us, show us, reveal to us as we just go on that journey of humility. I know it's like descending, if you will, into something great, but that's, that's the way to greatness. And you say that those who humble themselves will be exalted. May that thought really just resonate with us. May it overwhelm us in a beautiful way that we now live understanding humility is the path to pleasing you and to building the best life possible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May you have a really good week.